Hi all, I hope you had a good spring break and I'm looking forward to seeing you on Friday where we will further develop our exploration of mindfulness, getting into mindfulness and movement a little bit more formally, as well as going deeper into negotiation and the integration of mindfulness and mindfulness practices into an area like negotiation, which as we're beginning to explore, and as you undoubtedly know, just runs through the current of so many moments of our lives, not only professionally, but also personally. So uh, you'll be reading from the chapter on uh, movement, and I encourage you to be practicing the So Be Mindful Movement method that we've been doing in class that's talked about more fully in the book and for which you have videos that you can watch of me demonstrating it so that you can use that if you'd like to guide yourself. Very importantly, it's not so much aspects of the movement as much as it is the way we can become more mindfully aware while engaged in movement. And then of course to bring that into walking that we've begun talking about all semester long in certain respects, even as it relates to the um, present moment pivot point that integrates mindfulness and movement and walking. Though we didn't necessarily look at it or talk about it that explicitly, but now perhaps you can see how that was happening then and we're continuing that exploration. When we get to the Low Art Museum early one morning, a couple of Fridays from now, we'll be doing some mindful walking there as well. In addition, it's an opportunity to refresh yourself on the reading from the week before last where we got into negotiation from the textbook and also to go deeper with the law review article written by Leonard Riskin that's referenced in the chapter. Now you can get a copy of this from the website which has a link to the law review article or you could go to the copy center and they have a hard copy available to you because we'll really be parsing this and you'll be drawing upon this in a variety of ways, um, both as it relates to deepening your understanding of mindfulness, also understanding your connection, the connection between mindfulness and negotiation, and probably drawing upon it in certain respects for writing your paper. I encourage you, whether you print it out yourself or whether you pick up a copy at the copy center, that you have a hard copy and that you're using it to keep track of your notes and to be able to thoughtfully go through this very, very important piece, which we'll be going through in class on Friday and we'll be touching on um, across the rest of the semester. Alrighty, so you'll see on the class website that I zero you in on particular sections uh, of the law review article to be prepared to talk about and to think about in terms of the connection that Professor Riskin makes on how the practicing of mindfulness can be helpful for ameliorating some of the challenges to being as effective as we can be in a negotiation and in particular because he's writing about the core concerns that particular approach. You'll recall that in class we talked about the five core concerns and we began to explore how that approach can be one of many helpful uh, negotiation techniques and what's so important about uh, Professor Riskin's piece is that he talks not just about the technique, although he explains it very thoroughly, but how mindfulness practices can help a negotiator be even more effective in delivering on that technique. And that gets into the heart of so much of what we're exploring in class. And I think importantly, it connects it up to something that we can relate to, which is a simple negotiation technique like the core concerns. And so you've been uh, encouraged to practice the core concerns this week so that when we talk about it in class on Friday, it's not some abstract concept that you sort of have a vague sense of, but rather you've been thinking about integrating appreciation and affiliation and autonomy and status and role in your conversations with others as a lens and then a lever as well as to yourself. So please be prepared to talk about how you have drawn upon it from time to time, how you've drawn upon it as a lens, how you've drawn upon it as a lever, what that means practically speaking, and what it means to apply it to someone else that you're having an interaction with, we could call the negotiation, or even yourself. And this of course moves into the realm of the negotiation. Related to this is continuing to practice do not interrupt. Not necessarily 
all the time and never interrupting, but certainly having it where it's on your mind to not interrupt in the midst of a conversation and to have that be a practice. And we'll talk again in class on how do not interrupt isn't just a technique for communicating that may or may not be useful at various times, more often than not is, not always, but rather is a mindfulness practice. And you're having a sense of the distinction between do not interrupt as a technique for a more effective communication and as a mindfulness practice, which is very, very different from it as a technique, is something to understand conceptually and one of the ways of doing that is to begin to and continue to integrate the uh, do not interrupt uh, practice into your day. Uh, related to that is the going to the balcony. This is something that we touched on briefly. You read about it in William Urey's article where he explains it. And it's talked about in the negotiation chapter that you read last week. This is another metaphor that we've learned and that we'll now be applying. And it's very relevant for do not interrupt. It's very relevant to the core concerns and it's very relevant to mindfulness in many, many forms. Um, of course, William Urey, a master of negotiation, tethers it into the negotiation context and we're using that as a platform to explore it more broadly. So please be refreshed on going to the balcony and be um, practicing going to the balcony. And finally, and perhaps most importantly in terms of guidance for your assignment this week, you have a form that asks you to reflect on and identify three challenging situations and the obstacles that they raise. Now we'll be meeting in small groups to go over your assignments uh, in time after you've had a chance to do this assignment and then to massage it a little so that our meetings can be informed and as helpful as possible because this is something that you likely will be bringing into your paper. And understanding the relationship between the challenges and the obstacles and how mindfulness practices and being more mindfully aware can be helpful to you in meeting the obstacles, not necessarily the challenges, but the obstacles, um, is something that's very important to have a relatively deep understanding of. And so the guidance that I wish to give you here, that's a, um, just a reiteration of what's on the website, um, but probably will be helpful, is that you are to identify three very specific situations. So where it says a challenge, it's not some general challenge writ large. Oh, it's one of the challenges is being more a better listener in a conversation or um, um, having somebody you know talking to me when I'm busily doing other sorts of things. The, so that we can really parse what is a challenge, what is an obstacle, and how are the challenge and the obstacle that you identify connected, and how can mindfulness practice and being more mindfully aware connect directly to meet the obstacle that you've identified. It's very helpful to have a very specific challenging situation. So I offer on the form an example of, and that's also talked about in the book in one of the chapters, the neighbor upstairs is um, making a lot of noise, more specifically pounding on the floor while you're trying to get your work done. So the neighbor upstairs is pounding on the floor. That would be the challenge. It's very specific. More general and not as helpful would be a noisy neighbor, a neighbor that continues to make noise while I'm trying to work. That's generally pertinent, but we're talking about a specific example. Because when you're writing your paper, you're going to, in all likelihood, offer the reader specific examples, and then you're going to track them through the steps of understanding mindfulness, mindfulness practices, and why it is that mindfulness practices can be helpful in that situation in terms of the obstacles that might well um, be arising for you that could very well be arising for them. Um, and then you have a new practice, uh, the connection practice or loving kindness practice that we'll be getting into in next week's reading. But I offer a, um, a, a, a video uh, of a former law student, Luke Arrington, 
talking about and guiding that practice. So I think that you'll find that to be interesting and it's a terrific practice and it's one that we're going to be getting to. So I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about that practice in class. You're having been guided by really a former um, student and colleague. Um, all right, I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I look forward to seeing you on Friday. Hope you're having and have a good week. Take care.